Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for joining us today, Mitch. And I know that it's really uncharacteristic for philosophers, philosophers to list out their titles and, and so on, but I just did want to start by introducing you and mentioning that you are both Professor of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut since 2013, and you're involved in all these different research areas, which encompasses philosophy of mind, philosophy of art, philosophy of language. Um, but what we're focusing on today specifically is your work in the emotions facial expression and self-expression. And that's how I came across your work. Um, so your current research interests include the evolutionary biology of communication, speech acts and their role in conversation, empathy, self-knowledge, self-expression and attitude description. Um, and interestingly, I noticed you did your BPhil here in New College Oxford University um, and you did your PhD then back in the University of Pittsburgh. So you've written a number of books, The Philosophy of Language, Know Thyself, The Value and Limits of Self-Knowledge, Self-Expression, which is the first one that I read, and Engaging Philosophy, A Brief Introduction, as well as a number of articles. So welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. <laughs> so the Sound Pictures Conference that we're, which is why we're talking today, was actually inspired by this book, Self-Expression, that I read of yours when I was um, trying to get to grips with what makes a painting sad, which was my PhD topic. Um, and it was the first book on expression that actually that had been written since Tourmy in 1970. So I just wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about why you took that project on and what you wanted to achieve. Sure. Well, one answer is that I was surprised by how on the one hand, the notion of expression is used in so many different areas of philosophy and elsewhere, everyday life and how little theorized it has been or had been, and I think in many ways still is, up until the time that I wrote the book, as I suggest, even after that. So it seems to me there's just, in a way, a failure on the part of philosophers to try to get clear on one of the crucial concepts that we use in everyday life when we talk about behaviors that relate to communication, to understanding one another, to making our thoughts clear, those are often referred to in terms of expression, but surprisingly little work has been done by philosophers to understand how that, what that comes to. And I think this goes back at least as far as people like Ayer and his emotivist theory of ethical discourse makes heavy use of the notion of expression, says very little about it. Likewise with Carnap and many others who follow them. Um, uh, there was a little bit of work by Sellers in the 1960s. And then as you say, Tormey, and Guy Cercello did some work as well. But in some respects, the, the, that era of philosophizing was been made a bit defunct because they presupposed a fair bit of behaviors and particularly Tormi and Cercello. So I thought I'd try to do some work on the topic in a way that was, that was in the spirit of developments in cognitive science that have been, had been in the air for the last 30 years. So I wanted to do two things with my discussion of expression was, one was to try to put it in general terms, approach the notion and from the sort of wide, widest angle perspective that I knew how to do while encompassing the work that had been done in aesthetics, um, but also trying to bring it, bring discussion to it from what we know from the cognitive sciences and some recent work in the philosophy of language and philosophy of mind. And so that was the enterprise just to, you know, for, for me, I guess, Philosophy is at its best when it approaches phenomena that are important for everyday life, about which we have an intuitive grasp, but we don't have very much theoretical handle on. So my attempt was, my approach was to do something like this with the notion of expression. And um, the idea was to be informed, not just by intuitive, um, as it were, armchair philosophizing, but also in the process to to bring in work in the evolutionary biology of communication, for example, recent work in philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, to help to use those tools to shed light on the phenomenon too. Yeah, it was great. And, um, and it's interesting actually, because I would like to talk more about it, but um, interestingly, the reason that the book is so um, relevant to our discussion today is that your view on kind of not communication, but expression in the arts stands slightly apart from your view of how it works in the paradigm case. So you give, in the first parts of the book, you, you kind of outline the paradigm case and how it works. And it's like a sort of communication signal plus model, it, um, which kind of, which was, which was made, you know, interesting. And I'm sure that would provoke a lot of discussions. 
independently. But what I wanted to do was kind of say, having given a model of expression of what goes on paradigmatically, you then, in the concluding parts of the book, think about, well, how might this work in the artifacts case? So here we haven't got two people communicating, but we seem to have some kind of conveying of some important information between an object and a person. And that's how it fits in with the expression model. Um, in fact, I paraphrased, it, I paraphrased it this way, your view, this is the paraphrase, and you can tell me if it's wrong in, in the thesis. I said, in addition to showing us how an expression looks, pictures can also show us how expression feels. They can convey feeling because the phenomenal character of some colors just feels like the phenomenal character of some emotions. So I just wanted to concentrate today on what might this phenomenal fingerprint that you talk about consist in, in your view. Showing how, and that's a fairly broad notion, but it includes such things as showing how to do something as well as showing how something feels. And when I, for example, express my anger by virtue of yelling, then I might show um, my anger, but in such ways make it perceptible. But I also uh, think that one can show one's emotions and other experiential states by means of expression. And that's a fairly bold thesis because it isn't obvious to a lot of philosophers and others how one could show how one feels in any substantial sense. So the idea of the latter chapter, the last chapter of the book was to try to develop a theory of that, at least sketch a theory of that. And the background for that approach is so the idea of my theory of expression as it applies to artistic expression starts with a posit I make about mental processing. And the posit is, it goes back to, this is inspired among others, by among others, people like work of Suzanne Langers. But the idea is that neurotypical human beings are able to discern affinities, first of all, between different sensory modalities, such as colors and sounds. They're also able to, to discern affinities between such sensory modalities and certain aspects of their affective states. Yeah. And those sensory modalities, the, the congruences or affinities that are able to be discerned, I'm gonna just give a sort of baby theory. I'm not committed to the details of it, but the idea is this is a story about how things might work. And the idea is that suppose that we are able to, on some level, probably unconsciously, identify aspects of an experience or an emotion along three different dimensions. One dimension would be pleasant, unpleasant, unpleasant. The posit that I want to just offer is one way to think about this would be the supposition that for an emotion or a sensory experience, that gets mapped onto what I'm thinking of as, as a three-dimensional space, where one dimension is in terms of intensity and um, calmness. Another dimension would be in terms of pleasantness and unpleasantness. And a third would be in terms of activity or so the three dimensions I want to posit as a sort of way to think about what might be going on here is that when we experience an emotion and when we experience a sensory have a sensory experience from a certain modality we are able to in a sense map that onto a three-dimensional space that where one dimension is one one um, coordinate as it were is going to be in terms of intensity or mildness. Yeah. Other one's going to be in terms of pleasantness or unpleasantness. Another one will be in terms of dynamic as opposed to static. Yeah. And it is that to take the simplest case, if you, for example, hear a sound, a relatively, you know, like a musical chord, or for example, um, uh, see a color, you're able to intuitively think of that as static or or not static to a certain degree pleasant or unpleasant to a certain degree, and so on. And the thought also is that we can do that for affective states as well, whereby affective states have a distinguish between emotions and moods. Emotions require objects, moods don't necessarily bring objects with them. So then the idea is that if we're able to map 
our experiential states and our affective states onto that hypothetical three-dimensional space or into that hypothetical three-dimensional space, then a given, for example, emotion is going to be occupying either a point or some region within that space. And the same thing will be the case with experiences from a certain sensor modality. And then it's by virtue of noticing, again, probably at the unconscious level, at, at, by virtue of noticing overlap or even the identity of space occupied within that cube, as it were, we're able to detect affinities between yeah. emotions and, and experiences on the one hand or inter-experiential, that is between two types of experience on the other. So yeah. I'm not, I don't, I don't have to assert that I know for sure that there are three dimensions. I don't have to assert that I know for sure that those three dimensions, the ones that I, that I posit, but that would be a kind of model for how the theory would purport, purport to explain the fairly well established experimentally phenomenon such as we associate the color yellow with high pitched sounds more than we do with low pitched sounds. And yeah. so, so insofar as we have psychological evidence that people do find affinities, congruences between experiences and between emotions and experiences, this is the kind of theory that I claim would account for, the, for that experience. For, for those phenomena, our experience yeah. that we intuitively feel and that can also be experimentally corroborated. So you get this, I mean, one of the things that I like about this, the appeared of this theory, is you get this very um, clever story about why a picture can look, so you would use this term as you describe it, why it can look like a certain expression feel, right? So, so starting with the simpler case of sense to sense affinities, which I think most people would be more uh, likely to be intuitively on board with perhaps, um, non-metaphorically, just to take it very literally. Um, your view is that, Carla, the idea is that going from that kind of, well, yellow has this has this kind of affinity with a light sound, but then it sound like a piccolo, you might say, okay, but what you're saying is you're pushing it that the color perception can be valent in a way, in the way that a sincere expression can be, that seems to be the thrust of it. And the reason it can be is because if you look at it from this higher level, so once you kind of, just, kind of move one meta step up from the specificity of that qualia and you put it in these more abstract terms it's sharing that same sort of qualitative profile with whatever the feeling the appropriate feeling would be and so in this way red can act as some kind of surrogate or substitute for the the affect the feel that goes along with an emotion so it might not be that it gets as specific as um, an emotion per se, it might just be certain feeling physiological or feeling profiles that go along yeah. with certain emotions. Um, and that would work for you too. Um, That's but right. why, so why then given that, so I, I like that, but why would it then be that I don't get that kind of weighty valence feeling if I just look at a red wall? I mean, I, I kind of pick it up through certain pictures and certain works of art or even in certain films when I've kind of been led to it but why would that it doesn't always seem to hold so I think there are a number of factors that could get in the way here one of which is I want to know what is the context in which we're looking at the red wall in question sometimes we're not inclined to pay much attention or other things are getting in the way of our of our Experience. So if we're approaching a red wall for purely practical reasons, we're driving by or we're in a hurry, it might not have the same, same aesthetic effect that we would, would otherwise expect it to. Um, uh, so, so that's one aspect of it. Another of it is that it could actually generate a certain emotional response, but that's it's just one that's muted. So, yeah. so just as the theory of facial expressions that comes from the evolutionary biology of communication says that we have a common substratum of generally speaking innately driven tendencies to respond in certain ways to environmental stimuli that result in certain types of emotions associated with certain facial expressions there's sort of a biological substratum that's i would say as part of our human nature but on top of that there's a lot of culture okay. and those cultural effects can make a big difference for how we actually express ourselves i would guess that something like that tends to go on in our experience of colors and the relation to emotions and other sensory experiences so that there can be a great deal of conventional effects that 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 complicate the story about how responses tend to go along with our visual auditory or other experiences. 
And to be really clear, or some people might be familiar with some forms of this in neuroatypicals, so the common, the, or the well-known cases of the synesthetic, but you're saying this is, this is prevalent in the neurotypical community, that, the, that maybe we've learned to kind of override or suppress these affinities as situations demand. So it might, be, it might be something to do with attentiveness. I'm no longer attentive to the red wall in the right way and therefore I can't, I'm not picking up on the affinity. Or it might be something to do with the fact that only some of these affinities are hardwired and the rest might be kind of potentialities that then get sorted out through your upbringing in some way. That's right, exactly. And, and some of these emotional effects might not be very strong. Now, you know, as I, as I add more explanations for how to deal with counterexamples, or at least cases that don't obviously fit into the theory, that puts me in danger of ending up with a theory that's neither falsifiable nor confirmable. So, so I'm, I'm aware of that, of that sort of challenge. Um, but, you know, let's think about cases in which it's not just a red wall, it's a red wall in a room that you can't leave. Right. And one wonders whether that's going to have an emotional impact on the person that's stuck inside. And yeah. we... There are reasons why we find certain surroundings intolerable after a while. And one possible reason is that, is that they have affective effects on us that are pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. So, so these sorts of claims would need further experimental validation, not just conceptual clarification, but further experimental validation. And uh, you know, I certainly don't want to be in a position of, of guarding them and surrounding them with so many qualifications that they couldn't possibly be be uh, refuted, but but it seems to yeah. me it's asking what would a further test or set of tests look like that ended up providing evidence for a theory of, that, of this sort. And I think that there are tests that should be done both behaviorally in terms of people's responses and self-reports, but also probably neuro neurological tests that could be done that could okay. figure out how these things play out. So one of the virtues of your hypothesis is that you, you, you kind of see a way for this to be tested through some kind of randomized control trial, whether, whatever it is, so that you can get the right end sample number. And then presumably as things progress, one can even imagine that, you know, if we do take that trip to Mars, some of these things might actually be, have practical uses as well. So Absolutely. there's kind of both the testing and then the kind of, well, these are environments that you want people to remain healthy in if they're not in the environment that we're naturally part of anyway. So when you get into highly tampered with environments, and that's something that maybe uh, I was asked, I was interested uh, before we move on to the next bit, which is the empathy claim. So there's two steps to your claim. The first is that there's these natural affinities, right? And um, there's some significant property at play here, which which is underlying this kind of congruence. But the second step is that, and as you said before, it's about your attentiveness. And part of that attentiveness or being in the right attention mode is to be empathizing in your view, to sort of be open to and engaging in some kind of fellow feeling which is a kind of intimate emotion, emotion um, affinity, if you like. Um, but in this case, it's going, sense, it's going sensory perceptual to emotion rather than um, person's emotion to emotion. Right. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But just before we do, I just wanted to ask you about this idea of, so I, I once raised this question without you in the room. So you weren't there to answer it, but I said, oh, maybe in an untampered with environment, these things would be much clearer, but with a tampered with environment. And then everyone said, what's a tampered with environment? And my only way that I could think of one was the kind of tampering we've done with our food and our sense of taste. So we very much tampered and, and actually become very used to mixing up and, dis and, and sort of detaching the taste of things from biochemically, from the actual source of that original taste. And I wondered if that you've looked into that and, and how it particularly affects whether there was anything, because I didn't read anything in your work, but it might be something you decided not to put in. It's just not something I've done yet, but it's something I care about and would like to do someday. That is okay. to say, it seems to me those, as you say, as you call tampered with environments are potentially very important for testing and, and further you know, articulating the hypothesis in question here. You're absolutely right that perhaps terrifyingly so, the, the food industry and, and elsewhere and, and other, other institutions are extremely good at detaching experience, experiences we have from food with the nature of the food itself. In many cases, it's hard to even call it food. Um, uh, so you're absolutely right that, that, you know, chefs and chemists who work for large, large food industry um, work for the food industry are capable of playing on our experiences and I would also say on our emotions by virtue of affecting our palate. Yeah. 
just the hypothesis I've never been able, I've not just not had a chance to develop in any, in any yeah. in detail. It'd be interesting to see if there are some connections back there as well with Wonka and what it does to your ability to maybe kind of play with these wider affinities to affect. So, you know, if that is something that's causing perhaps um, great, great confusion in appetite, which might link more to the effect plates rather than to the sort of straightforward sensory gateways as we understand them. Uh, let's move on to this issue about empathy. So this is something that I, I criticized quite heavily in an article that I wrote about you that I couldn't make sense of how empathy fits in to the picture here, to the attentive state. And that was purely because of my understanding of empathy. It is, it, the definition requires you to have a fellow feeling with someone else's emotional state. So I wasn't clear how you could be empathizing without the appropriate object in view. And I wonder if you could just help me out um, understanding how it works in this case. Sure. So for me, fellow feeling is a relatively vague expression that I just use kind of a pointer towards the account that I'd want to give. One thing that I think is important about empathy is that it does involve, it does involve imagination. It does not require actual what, what some literature calls emotional contagion. So for me, I can empathize with someone without feeling as they're feeling. Instead, it's, what's necessary is that I imagine my way into their shoes, where of course the into their shoes is a, is a, metaphor, is a metaphor that needs to be spelled out. And that requires essentially um, activating my acquaintance with an emotional state that corresponds appropriately to theirs. So there's such a thing as imagining incorrectly in the case of empathy. I've got to imagine correctly, but I believe a lot of other authors have confused imagining correctly with a, a, a kind of literal notion of fellow feeling that requires feeling with that person, actually sharing their emotion, which I think is just unnecessary. So in the book, they give the example of the, uh, empathizing with somebody who's feeling ostracized. And, and I argue that you can empathize with someone's feeling of ostracism without having to yourself feel ostracized. That would be very nice, but it seems to be unnecessary to feel ostracized in order to empathize with them. Instead, you have to activate your, for example, prior acquaintance with a sense of ostracism and then use that as a sort of prop in which you, in which you imagine your way into your shoes. And, the, and so for me, that's the, that's the sort of core of the story about, about empathy. And empathy also has downstream epistemic effects. But for me, the, the crucial part of it is that I, I, I use it as an, I, I use an imaginative way into somebody else's state of mind and or feeling. Okay. And, so, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, so the idea is that that, that sort of openness um, or lowering of barriers to the other's um, feeling is what uh, the capacity that's being weighed against these kind of affinity properties. So instead of looking at, so the idea is, because of course, with the whole, whole idea with the art case is that you're not looking at a facial expression to read off what that state of mind is. You're kind of reading off these, let's just for the simplicity say it was a, a chord or um, an abstract design of colors. And the idea is that you see those and then you map to these higher states you, you kind of in touch with those affinities or an openness to them and you use your capacity for empathy to try and work out you know okay so it's like an experiential thing how do i how do i understand what's being conveyed here um, that's right that's the idea right that's right so the, okay go on go on and i just wanted to say empathy can be used in the most sort of discussed cases empathy can be used to understand how somebody's feeling in the affect sense but if i'm right then it can also be used understand what somebody's experience is like that is to say to get a handle on somebody else's qualitative or experiential state yeah. and this claim is a non-standard one um it's it, it should come it's intended to come as a as a bit of a pushback or a surprise to many authors who have talked about expression who tend to say that it's not clear what it means to express one's experiential states whereas our would argue that I'm not claiming that's easy. It might take some skill, it might take the subtlety and depth and insight of an artist to do it. But it seems to me there's no conceptual barrier to someone with the appropriate skills enabling others to empathize with their experiential state, not just their emotional state. So okay. that's so that is intended to come, and I think I guess I feel it should come as a bit of a surprise, controversial one, presumably, 
about the scope of the theory of expression here, and, and likewise that of empathy. So you push it all the way to the kind of pushback on the Megalian, what, you know, what's it like to be a bat? Well, this, this might be a way of us finding out some of those answers. Let's say that this is an alternative theory. So it's the simplest, most intuitive, but false theory was something like when, an art, when, when you see expression in a work of art, when you see a painting and what makes it sad is the fact that the artist felt sad. They tipped that emotional state into the work, transmitted it to you, the viewer, who picks it up and feels it kind of almost as if it's in perfect form, just kind of being right. communicated through. That's not your story. It's a much right. more sophisticated story. And that the outcome, what the viewer feels at the end of that, isn't just a straightforward arousal to that emotional state, but they, they're aroused to the kind of sensations they need so that the mental state they're in is in some case, is in some sense homologous to the one they would have if they were in the actual paradigmatic scenario. So all the things that they're using to get into that mental state are non-paradigmatic, but to them, to introspection, they're not able to, to sort of note the difference. To them, it's, it's doing its job, it's as fit for purpose. As, and that's why this theory could then extend to things like experiential states and more, you know, the, if we become more sophisticated in using this tool, we could extend it. Is that, is that the idea? That's right. That's right. And as artists come up with new ideas for making their experience manifest in some way, that also yeah. enables this, you know, fellow feeling, let's put quotation marks around it because it doesn't require actually experiencing what they experience, but it does require in some sense, noticing with reference to that three dimensional space, something like, oh, what they're going through is over there in that cube. Right. Probably Actually, had thought, but in effect, that's in effect what happens. So that that enables me to know, so to speak, how to go to where they are, if only imaginatively. Okay. 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 So the idea is that it's a it's if if this is right, then it's something that we've missed largely because it happens at the below the level of conscious awareness, but that enables a fellow feeling again put put broadly, so that we're able to understand how others feel. And I should also say, if a lot of this is driven by unconscious processes, it would also, the, the approach would also predict that it could well be that I understand how somebody else's feel, somebody else feels or what they're experiencing without being fully conscious of that fact. Right. Okay. So there doesn't have to be a phenomenal openness. You don't have to be kind of aware of the phenomenology to, to be kind of better at improving your skills at it even. It just could be something that you, you, you know, through practice. Now I just wanted to ask you, we've got the theory in view, how might we actually apply this in a practical situation? Right. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get an image of the of the do it yeah, that I that I was talking about before. And there are a number of interesting things about DeWitt as an artist. He, you know, in general did not produce identifiable works at the Sydney Museum and Hang. Rather, he produced instructions for creating works. Yeah. And so if you want to have an exhib exhibition of DeWitt, what you do is you have to you know, get the get the blueprint and then go and make it yourself, which I think is a fascinating concept that has not, so far as I know, been taken up. It was thought to be revolutionary and I think still is in a way that has not become quite generalizable um, in the world, of, in the artistic world. So that's one thing worthy of mention. But in the particular work that I was that I was asking us to think about, it seems to me that's a not bad example of the sort of affinities that we can see between visual experiences and affective responses. It's hard for me to look at that and get a sense of well-being and there's some exuberance and there's something high-spirited about it and so forth. This is, this is one of his works from the 1960s as opposed to the works from the 40s and 50s which tend, tend to be more black and white. And so part of what I, what I find interesting about DeWitt is that this is an, a, a, a work of art which experiencing we tend to have a kind of valenced kind of reaction and the, the story would be an account of my, my account would be one that would help help explain how that goes we okay. intuitively are able to notice an affinity between the experience of the visual experience we're having again we place it in a certain region within our cube as it were three-dimensional space and then by virtue of noticing an affinity between what's occupied in that region and the way in which are relatively positive, relatively active emotions, such as happiness, are also in roughly that region, we're able to discern that, that, that affinity. It might all be the case that we're made to be happy, <laughs> that we're made to feel happy by that experience, but it's, I'm not sure that that's a necessary connection. That might be yeah. something.
it's something more at the level of probabil probability in general, all things being equal, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And just going back to what we were saying before about the, how your theory is more sophisticated than transmission theory, I watched the video actually, which we'll put, we'll put on the website, that video with, with the interviews. But as you say, the interesting point is, first of all, there is a complete disconnect between what the artist gets up to and the work scene. So there's no sense in which you can say, well, you, you're seeing his hand in the brushwork because his hand isn't there. It's just a set of instructions. And the second one is the kind of reaction that the students or whoever it was, the visitors were talking about in the sense of, you know, you could, you needed the gray. They were saying, I needed the gray. I needed somewhere to rest my eye because it would just mm -hmm. make them, it was too overwhelming. It was kind That's of, right. they had an, an makes a perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Exactly. Because yeah, if it were too red and orange and so forth, it would be just loud, overwhelming. It would just be too much in some way. So when, when they said, when the students said, the gray is a place to rest my eye, I really heard that. It's been quite, uh, quite appropriate because you can understand why they want to rest, given the relatively affectively exhausting experience they're having with the rest of the work. Yes. That, that's, that's true, actually. There was a sense of which they came out of the room. They said they were kind of, they were, there was a sense of exhaustion, actually, that they had been, and they needed the white wall to kind of calm down. That, yeah, that yeah. was, I'll watch it again. Just as you would expect from something that's at the active, intense yeah. dimension. Yeah, totally. So thank you for the interview today. And just to make it clear to everyone, this is just a pre-watch, and you will actually be giving your keynote live on the 10th of July at the, at the conference. So people should definitely tune in to hear hear the latest the latest screen news then that's right well thank you so much for for talking with me it was a pleasure and always uh always exciting to see that other people are are learning about and engaging actually with the stuff i've thought about so that's 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 a lot of fun and i look forward to engaging with everybody at the conference itself i'm excited to to be there and to uh, <laughs> as best we can, given the circumstances. Yeah.